So many people are looking to live happier, more stress-free lives. We provide interviews from mental health experts across various fields because we know finding quality information isn't always easy. Let's find more sanity together. Hello and welcome back everybody to Sanity Podcast. I have a very special guest for me today. I, I sometimes say half of all I know, I know from uh, Dr. Robert Leahy, Bob Leahy. Uh, quick introduction, uh, Dr. Leahy is the director of the American Institute for Cognitive Therapy in New York City and clinical professor of psychology in the Department of Psychiatry at Will Cornell Medical College. He is also the associate editor of the International Journal of Cognitive Therapy and is past president of the Association for Behavioral and Cognitive Therapies, the International Association for Cognitive Psychotherapy, and the Academy of Cognitive and Behavioral Therapies. But wait, there's more. He is a recipient of the Aaron T. Beck Award from the Academy of Cognitive and Behavioral Therapies, is author and editor of 29 books for mental health professionals, including his new book, If Only, and The Worry Cure, which is an amazing book. If you haven't read The Worry Cure, you should go buy it right now while you're listening. And his books are so impressive, they've been translated into 21 different languages. That's a lot of readers, Bob. Um, he's been featured in the New York Times, Sunday Magazine, Forbes, Fortune, Newsweek, Psychology Today, Washington Post, Wall Street Journal, Red Book, Shape, Women's Health, Self Magazine, US Today Magazine, and many others. He's also been on national and local radio such as BBC, NPR, 2020, Good Morning America, and The Early Show. Okay, have I missed anything <laughs> uh, uh, that, that, should, that, sh that I should be introducing you on? It sounds like you covered just about everything. <laughs> Fantastic. All right. So you spent a considerable amount of time writing a book about regret. Right. What got you on this train of regret? Well, first, thank you, Jason, for having me on. It's good to see you again. Um, you know, what I realize is that many of my patients, uh, friends, family members, even myself at times have had regret. And um, that even though cognitive behavior therapy seems to address a lot of issues in anxiety and depression, there really wasn't anything out there that did a deep dive into regret, really trying to understand regret and give us the tools to deal with regret. So I'm always looking for a challenge. You know, I've written books on worry and on jealousy and on emotions in general. Uh, so I thought this would be an interesting uh, topic. Uh, I've also realized for a number of years, I've written uh, a number of chapters and articles uh, on how people go about making decisions. And regret is potentially a part of any decision that we could make. So um, uh, I can see that people who are depressed often uh, dwell on their past decisions, uh, labeling themselves as a failure, that their regret becomes uh, uh, pervasive and uh, psychologically uh, disabling. So it seemed like a challenge mm -hmm. and... Uh, and I hope that the book is uh, useful to people. I think it can be. Yeah. One of my, um, I don't know if you say it's, it's a complaint, but, uh, but observations about the empirically supported treatment field is that we focus a lot on depression and anxiety, particularly anxiety. But not too many people are spearing the, forehead, uh, the forefront of regret, jealousy, uh, other negative emotions that impact people on a daily basis that people might be struggling with or might be impacting into their depression, anxiety, or their just general unhappiness. Um, so what opened, I guess, your eyes to say, well, yeah, depression, anxiety is important, but why not focus on these other things? Well, you know, I guess, I guess my sense is that um, that we have a lot of really excellent uh, theories and models of treatment, uh, like the Beck cognitive model, uh, the acceptance commitment model, the behavioral model, mindfulness model. <clears throat> um, and I think what people tend to do, they start with their model and then they apply it to um, an emotion like anxiety. 
uh, and that's very useful. But there are these complicated emotions that people have worldwide, like jealousy and envy, regret, ambivalence, resentment. Uh, these kinds of emotions really plague people. And what I do, Jason, I start with the emotion. And then I try to make sense of the emotion. How did this emotion evolve? Like, how did jealousy evolve? You know, why is it that jealousy seems to be a fairly common emotion, not only among humans, but among animals? Um, is there an evolutionary basis of this emotion? And then how does this emotion manifest itself? What are the thought patterns with the emotion, the behavioral, the interpersonal patterns with the emotion? Um, uh, how could it be useful? So if you if you take regret, uh, you know a lot of people will say, uh, "Well, I don't regret anything. I I did what I did, and I just move on." I guess my view of that is that regret is a way in which we learn from mistakes, and if we mm -hmm. if we don't have that pang of regret to say, you know, what was wrong with me that I thought that or I did that, how do we learn from our mistakes? So. Regret, I argue that, you know, regret can be a very painful emotion. It can, you know, be almost like emotionally disabling where people ruminate and criticize themselves, but it could also be productive. And I could talk a bit about that as well. Um, but, but isn't regret uh, like a negative emotion? D don't people want to just not, you know, it's bad, right? Like get rid of regret, get rid of jealousy, get rid of greed. Like we, we shouldn't be feeling all these bad things, yeah. right? Well, uh, I know a lot of people will say that, um, but uh, let me suggest a number of things that make me think that regret is not always a bad emotion. It can be a painful and unpleasant emotion, just like physical pain can be, or hunger or thirst can be mm -hmm. uh, painful, unpleasant, but they're there for a reason. So, for example, what do we know about uh, people who seem to lack the ability to regret? Uh, people who are very impulsive uh, act as if they won't regret it. You know, people who yell and scream or overdrink or misuse drugs or who are aggressive, they act in ways in which they do not anticipate regret. Uh, people who are manic, if you've ever dealt with a person in a manic phase, it's almost as if they think they can get away with anything. Uh, people who ride motorcycles without helmets on I-95, mm -hmm. which I'm sure you've seen, uh, these are people oh, yes. who don't anticipate ending up in the, um, in the ICU with uh, serious head injuries. So there are people who have a deficit of regret. The other thing that's interesting, Jason, is that the research on children shows that children at about the age of six or seven first begin expressing and experiencing regret. And the kids who express regret are actually better at making decisions and better at regulating their behavior. And it's because they anticipate that if I do that, I'm going to regret it. And so they do a mental rehearsal and think, well, that's not going to be a good plan. So I won't do that. And so they're better at making decisions, better at regulating their behaviors. So there's a productive aspect of regret. And just, and just like all of our negative emotions, there's a productive, there's no bad emotion. All of our negative emotions have some sort of uh, reason why they're there. They're meant to propel us to do something healthy, hopefully. Right. Yeah. Uh, most I mean, emo emotions evolve because... They motivate us. They get us to do things uh, or they get us to avoid things. So I'm not, I don't take a Pollyannish view of regret and think, oh, you should never regret or that regret is just a, a, a passing emotion because it can be disabling. And so it's finding that it's having regret about the right things, the right proportion and using it in the right way. And I think that's an important thing to, I mean, to say to somebody, don't ever regret anything um, is really giving a person uh, almost like permission to do whatever they want without considering the outcome, the consequences. And we, you know, we don't want uh, people to be taking unnecessary risks. Uh, so that's where regret comes in. It's a 
productive emotion if you use it to motivate yourself to improve your behavior, but it becomes unproductive when you ruminate about it, you criticize yourself and you get stuck and you don't take reasonable uh, chances. You are simply avoid and remain passive and isolated. And I think a lot of people who are depressed are suffering from a lot of regret. Mm -hmm. And, you know, avoidance of our emotions is a huge cause of having um, a, a pathological degree of emotion, including avoiding your regret. Right. Like, for example, uh, in one of the chapters in my book, uh, If Only, uh, I describe uh, guilt as a potentially uh, adaptive emotion. And um, I mean, guilt is regret on steroids. You know, a person says, oh, I feel, I, you know, I shouldn't have done that. And then I feel terrible about it and that sort of thing. So how could guilt be productive? Let, let's just imagine this. You're a single person and you're, uh, they're cutting the grass outside here. You're a single person <laughs> and you're looking for a partner, a life partner. Um, that you, the person says, you know, Jason, I really like you, but I want to tell you I'm incapable of ever experiencing regret, guilt, or shame. Uh, would you feel like you could trust this person? Do you think that you would want to that make sounds a life like a call? big red flag to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, you don't want somebody who says, I feel guilty about everything, but you want somebody who has that ability to control their behavior uh, because they think, well, that would be the wrong thing. And I would feel bad if I did that to Jason. And what's interesting is they find in research that uh, that people who express guilt are uh, better able to work in groups and in, in a business environment. Uh, they're better able to get along with people. People trust them more. Um, people who are able to express their guilt and, and ask for an apology to sincerely communicate that they really feel bad about what they've done, uh, those people are more likely to maintain or heal the relationships that they have. So there are ways in which these emotions that we tend to think are really bad emotions, we should never have them, that we can use them in a productive way at times. It's not an all or nothing thing. It's not like regret is always bad. It's not always good. It's uh, the right amount of regret for the right reasons at the right time, expressed in the right way. Mm -hmm. So, so it's like a tool, you know. If it's used correctly, that's yeah. fantastic. If it's used incorrectly, then that that's not that's not so yeah. great. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's, it sounds like regret goes forwards and it goes backwards. Meaning, one, if we predict that we're going to have regret in the future, it helps us modulate our behavior so we don't do something yeah. bad. And then if we do something bad, right. the regret uh, yeah. teaches us a lesson so we don't yeah. do it again. Yeah. Or hopefully that's what the regret does. Yeah, exactly. And it, with, what's interesting is that, um, that, we, that we tend to think that if we take a new action, uh, we're, we're going we're gonna to regret it more than if we stay where we are. So making a change, we tend to anticipate more regret than staying where we are. Um, but in the long term, what the research shows is that people regret more what they chose not to do. Uh, yes. Chose not to pursue a relationship or a job or be assertive or tell somebody they love them or broke off from a relationship. So in the long term, people regret what they did not do. Uh, and th we find this throughout all the cultures that have been studied. It's not just an American culture, uh, this kind of regretting more what I did not do. But we can we can have we can anticipate regret about the future. Like if I have too much spicy food, I may not be able to sleep so well. I might feel ill, whatever. So I can anticipate that regret uh, or mm -hmm. regret about things I did in the past. Uh, people often think regret is about what you did in the past, but it's actually regret about what you could or could not do. Okay. Um, so th there's some steps that you take 
in order to analyze regret in your in your new book like i think you propose like a six a six a five or six step model um and and i i have them have them here to to pull up and i, and I was just wondering you know the importance of of going through these steps um give me just one second here okay so it, it was first step normalize that we all make mistakes Focus on what you could learn, not on what you did wrong. Uh, number three is what were you thinking when you made the decision? Number four was what were you ignoring when you made the mistake? Uh, how can you use the information you've gathered and how can you avoid making this mistake in the future? So you had said before that you take the emotion, you try to understand it, and then you work from that to figure out um, how it's useful and then how to make it a therapeutic tool. So what made you come up with this list as a proposed way to handle regret? Well, you know, what I, what I notice is that there are some people who, um, who are able to express that they realize they made the wrong decision and they learn from it. And then there are other people who keep making the wrong decision over and over. Um, and what's, what's interesting, Jason, is that some people, some people are re- good, good decision makers make mistakes. Good decision makers make bad decisions. And I think it's an important thing to keep in mind. This is part of normalizing regret. No matter what you do, you're going to make a bad decision at some point, uh, or the outcome is going to be something you don't want. Um, so I would first normalize making, making mistakes. Uh, and the second thing I would say, what did you learn from a mistake? My view is never waste a good mistake. You know, like if you say something to your partner and you realize it was unkind or unnecessary, you can learn from that mistake and become a better partner. Uh, the people who don't learn from mistakes and keep justifying their mistakes, those are the people who actually in the long term have more reason to regret. You know, so you, you can look at people who, uh, misuse drugs or alcohol or overspend money, get into a great deal of debt, uh, or don't get the work done, or they're constantly late. These are people who make mistakes. Uh, we all do. Uh, we're all going to make those kinds of mistakes at times. But do we learn from it? I think the other thing that I've learned from my own experience, especially when I was a younger, younger uh, man, was to learn from the mistakes of other people. So what I observed is that, uh, you know, people I knew in college or in my youth, people were misusing drugs or over drinking. And I thought, gee, I don't want to end up like that. So rather than my going out and carrying out the experiment of over drinking or misusing drugs or, you know, whatever, uh, I decided I'm going to learn from their mistakes. I'm going to learn from the regrets they should have had. And I think that's, a, you know, if you want to learn how to be more successful, look at the people who are not successful in the mistakes that they made. Mm. So, so we can observe, uh, you know, by, vicariously learn or learn from other people and say, what did they do? Right. Whether they regret yeah. it or not and think, man, yeah. I probably yeah. should have regretted that and then use that in order to teach yourself, which is, I mean, an excellent, excellent tool that, that you know, I hope most people do. Um, but a, lo- a lot of people, when they look back at their regret, they have the shoulda, woulda, coulda. Uh, I, I should have done this differently. I should have went down that road. I yeah. shouldn't have went to that bar. I shouldn't have dated that person. I shouldn't have, I shouldn't have, I shouldn't have. Um, how yeah. helpful is that, that sort of thinking? So, you know, what you're describing is uh, what I would call hindsight bias. Like I should have known the stock market's going to crash or I should have known my partner would not be uh, the person I thought uh, they were going to be, or I, you know, I should have this. But I think I think a lot of times when we sit back on Monday to predict the game, uh, the outcome of the game on Sunday, uh, uh, we don't realize that when we first made our decision uh, with that relationship or that investment or whatever it was, we were operating under uncertainty. Uh, we didn't have all the information. We thought our decision was a good decision. Um, and so, you know, people often think after they made a decision, they see the outcome. Oh, I should have known differently. I'm thinking about, 
you know, somebody I knew who, uh, who married uh, a man who, you know, initially seemed like a really decent person, but over the years, you know, developed a, a, a pretty uh, uh, difficult alcoholism uh, and became verbally abusive. That kind, you know, I should have known he was like that. When she first met him, he was the nicest guy in the world. And, you know, he was supportive and he was affectionate, generous, the whole thing. Uh, so I would question what information were you operating on when you initially made that decision? Having said that, there's always something to learn from your decisions. I mean, if you can think about decisions as experiments. Uh, so, for example, uh, <clears throat> if somebody makes a decision about a relationship simply based on looks and you know, rather than character or personality or social skills or values, uh, if you make a decision simply based on looks, then you might end up with somebody who's attractive, but not a good partner. Uh, I mean, attractive people can be good partners, but that's not the, not the equivalent. So learning from your decisions, learning from your mistakes uh, can be an important thing. Like, what was I basing that decision on? You know, was I simply uh, making a decision out of loneliness or desperation or based on looks uh, or, you know, se- uh, being impulsive? And that kind of learning experience, that's like an experiment. What was the outcome of the experiment? What am I going to do in the future? And I would normalize making the mistakes. Because, I mean, a lot of times people, when they have a regret, they go to the next step, which is self-criticism. And of course, you could always regret having too much regret. You can spend 10 years regretting and then realize after 10 years, that was a waste of time and then regret that you regretted for 10 years. So I think of regret as the as a step one. What did I learn from it? What information was I using making the decision? What outcomes was I expecting? Uh, what would I do differently in the future? So, so way back in grad school, when I was a, a youngling, <laughs> uh, I was in a research lab. Uh, we were looking and coding um, narratives of people that went through an adverse event or a tough time. And we, we would code if it was counterfactual thinking, which is a woulda, coulda, shoulda. Like I'm basing my information mm-hmm. off of something I didn't know at the time. Or we would code for if it was something that they said they knew and they did it anyway. And so I'm sitting here thinking a lot of times, and I could think of myself when I was a teenager, I know I shouldn't do it. I mean, even older, even now, I know I shouldn't do this, but I feel peer pressure. I'm too anxious. I'm too whatever. I'm too too scared not to do it anyway. And now I regret right. doing that thing. How do you handle yeah. the regret when you know you shouldn't have done it, but you didn't have the fortitude not to do it? Right. Yeah. So one, one thing I describe in the book is... Uh, uh, thinking about yourself as multiple selves. So uh, I'm Bob Leahy in the past, Bob Leahy today, and Bob Leahy in the future. And so a lot of times we make impulsive decisions about, you know, making a decision to feel good for the next hour or the next five minutes. So somebody, let's say, who abuses alcohol or drugs or uh, other kinds of uh, uh, impulsive types of behaviors, that person is making a decision for the immediate self, for how I'm going to feel in the next five minutes or the next hour. So you can look at where you're making a decision based on the immediate self, you know, short-term gratification, um, uh, to, or to avoid an emotion. I talk about making a decision for the future self. And here's what's interesting, Jason, about the research on this. <clears throat> that when half the people who are prescribed medication for high blood pressure end up not taking the medication a year later. So they put themselves at risk for stroke or whatever. When they've, and it's one study when they've asked people, think about yourself in a wheelchair. You know, you had a stroke, you're disabled, you paralyzed partly, whatever. And think about that as a possible outcome of not taking the medication there's a significant increase in medication compliance or uh, future savings. I mean, one of the problems that a lot of uh, people uh, experience is that they don't have a plan for saving for the future. 
So when they say to people that say 30 years old, I want you to think about yourself when you're 65 and at your current rate of savings, how you're going to live at 65. And picture yourself as an older person with uh, very limited uh, assets. When they ask them to think about their future self, they make better decisions about investments. They begin you know, having a, a forced savings plan. So one way of thinking about what you're describing is you're probably making decisions for your emotions at the present moment uh, rather than your future self. So one technique I use in therapy is uh, have the patient play the role of the future self, giving advice to the present self. So I'll be the you know present self. I just I eat as much as I want and drink a lot and act out and don't do my uh, work or whatever. And then the future self has to advise the current self. Uh, that allows us to get a better distance and make smarter decisions about the future self. The, set, the other thing that we tend to do in the way you described it is we tend to predict our emotions in the future. Like if I do this, uh, it's going to be extremely unpre- unpleasant. Uh, it's a, what's called by researchers affective forecasting. But what it really is, is predicting my emotions in the future. And we know that something like in one study by Gilbert at Harvard, that uh, people predicted their regret. Um, uh, they, they predicted 70% regret and they experienced about 25 or 30% regret. So they, they're, they're predicting many more regrets or negative emotions than they have. The other thing is sometimes you have to go through it to get, uh, to get past it. So, um, uh, I know that you exercise a lot and you're quite fit. Uh, I try to exercise every day. And my view about exercise uh, is that you have to make it a habit to do what you don't want to do so you can get to be where you want to be. And if you practice, if you practice what I call constructive discomfort, doing the hard things on a daily basis, you're going to make much more progress. And, and making progress is not about necessarily feeling a pleasant emotion. It's about feeling effective. And so uh, if you do the hard things and you think about how am I going to feel after the exercise or after I get my work done or after I make that, uh, that uh, engage in that difficult and challenging behavior, I'll probably feel more effective. I'll feel on top of things. Sometimes we have to do things we don't want to do. Yes. Yes, 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 yes. And that, that's a huge thing. I mean, you, 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 that was one big thing that you had taught me. And that's one thing that I, that I talk to my clients about all the time, that the people that are good at doing things they don't want to do, you know, tend to be able to be more successful in, in managing their lives right. because there's a lot yeah. of things that we don't want to do, which are very helpful to us. I don't feel like getting on my uh, spin bike for 45 minutes every, every, you know, not every day, five days a week, but I do it so I can live longer, be healthier, manage my weight, this, that, and the other. Uh, Yeah, but it's, it's not easy. Yeah. There, 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 there are two things. There are two things that I think are relevant to that. They're they're related to each other. One is emotional perfectionism, which is that uh, I really want to have pleasant emotions. You know, I want to feel, uh, I mean, one of the, one of the ways of overcoming anxiety is to do things that make you anxious. So, you know, we know from the research on exposure uh, that, you know, the way for somebody to overcome a phobia or overcome obsessive compulsive disorder is to actually do something that makes them anxious. And actually eliciting that anxiety is almost necessary to making progress. It's the willingness to do the things that make you anxious. Uh, and we, we, but we tend to think we have to feel pleasurable, happy, you know, like, you know, uh, running after happiness all the time uh, is something that will make you miserable because you're not going to be happy all the time. And I think this plays into regret because, you know, somebody, let's say somebody uh, gets married or they take a new job or whatever, and they're not happy all the time. You know, it's like, oh, you know, uh, happily ever after. It's a fairy tale. Uh, It's like working on things ever after. That's what married life is really about. Or that's what a relationship or that's what work is about 
it's working at it on a, on a regular basis. I think the other thing that plays into our, our expectations and our regret is what I call existential perfectionism, which is that I have to have this wonderful life and be fulfilled all the time and everything has to be great and all of that. And, um, one, you know, one of the things about dealing with uh, an outcome, say in a relationship or at work or, uh, or whatever it might be, uh, it's not existential perfectionism. It's living in the real world. And the real world is filled with noise. Uh, it's a matter of trade-offs. Like if you live in the, I'm up in Connecticut right now, but you know, we live in New York City. Um, if you're in New York City, there are trade-offs. There's a lot of noise, a lot of people, a lot of traffic. Things are more expensive, crowds and the whole thing. But it's New York. It's a great city. So you, you, you consider the balance and the trade-offs. Uh, when people deal with the outcomes, uh, the people have a hard time hold on to the expectation. Like, uh, I expected that my partner would be this way and he or she is not a hundred percent that way. So a lot of people regret just keep demanding that expectation. I want you to be the person I thought you were as opposed to I'm going to accommodate to the person that you are. So Jason, you know, you live in New York City. If you go out on 2nd Avenue to get a downtown bus, you'll see a little uh, bus schedule. That bus is going to arrive at 1012, at 1024, at 1036. The only people who look at that bus schedule are tourists because nobody who lives in New York thinks, thinks the bus is going to arrive at any of these times. You know, you'll see a caravan of the same bus coming down 2nd Avenue. And so what, I, what I'm saying is that one way of dealing with regret is to have flexible preferences and readjust your expectation. Flexible preferences is that, yeah, I would like the, uh, this particular thing, but, you know, I'm willing to accept this. I'm willing to accept that. Flexible preferences. And the other part of it is not that there's, there's a whole area of research on this kind of, uh, uh, existential, you know, inflexible expectation uh, called the maximizer. The concept that Herbert Simon, who got the Nobel Prize in economics uh, back about 60 years ago, 70 years ago, came up with this idea of maximizers, people who want the very, very best. I want absolutely the best partner. I want the best food. I want the best house, best car, whatever it is. And <clears throat> what these maximizers do is they demand tremendous amount of information. Uh, they take forever to make a decision and they're dissatisfied with the outcomes because they're always compared it to what they could imagine the best would be. The alternative is what I would call a satisfier. The satisfier is willing to be more flexible. Yeah, I prefer a hundred percent, but I could be satisfied with 80%. I don't need 90%. I could be satisfied with that. Uh, those people tend to be more satisfied with their decisions, have less regret, easier to make a decision. Uh, they don't uh, demand as much information. Uh, and even in the cases where maximizers actually obtain a better outcome than a satisfier, even when they get a better outcome objectively, they're less satisfied with the better outcome than the satisfier. So, so, uh, you know, the question would be in life, are you always chasing after the Holy Grail? Do you always want the 100%, in which case you'll be trading up? You know, people often say, well, I'm ambivalent about this person. If Should I get married to them? And uh, what if somebody else comes along who's better? I mean, how many times have you heard that or thought that? You know, what if somebody comes around who's better? Well, there are five and a half, six billion people in the world. How likely is it that you've chosen the absolute best person in the world, and they've chosen you as the absolute best person in the world. So this kind of, oh, somebody else could come along that's better. So what? So what some people do, they keep thinking, well, I'm going to put off getting married or make a commitment because somebody can come around that's better. Um, that's chasing after a receding reference. I, I need better, 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 better. And you see these people, they're on their third or fourth marriages and they're still miserable, you know, 
chasing after the receding reference point, as opposed to aiming for flexibility, acceptance, gratitude, appreciation, compassion, uh, and what I would call adaptive humility, which is that I'm a human being, I'm not entitled to the best, I make mistakes, I'm going to be forgiving, I'm going to be flexible. And so when we think about regret, Jason, we actually think about how we live our lives in general. You know, do we live our lives always demanding more, you know, never satisfied? Uh, you know, one area of research that's emerged in recent years is on contentment, you know. I mean, how often do you see uh, an ad for a product on television or on streaming or, you know, Google or whatever that actually says, well, this will help you be very content, content, contented, F finding a simpler way of life where you need less, you know. Our culture is based on creating and reinforcing false needs. So I need the the most recent iPhone, the most recent technology, the most advanced car or whatever. No, I don't. What I need to do is I need to learn to be contented with things. And nobody ever says what I really regret is being contented with the things in my life and the people in my life, including myself. I once asked a, uh, uh, a uh, very successful uh, medical professional, can you remember uh, an experience in your life when you just felt this contentment, like, oh, this feels really good? He said, yeah, I remember he, he was in uh, uh, medical school in the Midwest. And he said, uh, you know, near the campus, there was this pond and there were these ducks on the pond. And I remember sitting with my friends and this afternoon it was warm and sunny, and we were looking at the ducks. And he said, that was a really good feeling of contentment. So that became his duck contentment image, something to aim for. Mm -hmm. Man, you unpacked a lot of massive, massive, important principles in, in that segment of the podcast. And I use these principles on a daily basis for people that are having a hard time finding happiness in their life. And one thing that I really appreciate, and I think is part of your brilliance, is that you're not scared to check out other fields to see what they have found to implement it into therapy, like looking at economic behaviorism in order to see maximizers and satisfiers and say, well, how does that apply to uh, okay. to mental health? And and I, I, I you know that's one thing that I've always appreciated and loved about about your work. Um, but just to review some of these principles, um, because they all go together. Um, maximizers are people that feel like they could get the best of everything. And by trying to get the best of everything, they can't achieve it, which ends up creating their own misery. Right. Where satisficers exactly. say it needs to be good or great enough. And if I could get that, I'll be happy. But the drive of the maximizers, uh, number one, they fill up their days trying to do everything to the best so they can't enjoy themselves. And then they're always falling short of their expectations which just cycles into their, their daily, daily misery. And then spending time to find your happiness for today. What is good about today? What have I achieved? What can yeah. I be happy about? What yeah. can I appreciate is, yeah. is yeah. almost more powerful as what do I want to achieve for tomorrow to make my future happiness? And we find a lot of people out of balance between happiness for yeah. today and happiness for tomorrow right. and regret very easily yeah, plays it, into all this because these maximizers are worried they're going right. to regret uh, what's going to happen if they don't do it to their best or obtain everything they want from this false sense right. that I yeah. can achieve this pure happiness. Yeah, I think I think that the satisfier can have healthy high standards, have adaptive yes. high standards. Like you don't have to say, well, I'll be satisfied with zero. Uh, you know, you can be satisfied with very good. Uh, you could be satisfied with, you know, doing better than you've done before. Um, but if you think about, like, the issue of satisfying, what some people <clears throat> will say, well, I don't want to be satisfied because then I'll lose my edge. You know, I'll lose my motivation. Yep. Uh, I'll lose my desire yes, to strive. all the time. Right. What I, what I know with anything I write or anything I say 
or anything anybody else writes or anybody else says, there's going to be somebody out there who's not going to like it. I can absolutely guarantee, you know. And so what, I, what I've what mm-hmm. i done, I've taken this sort of uh, satisfying approach in writing. Uh, I'm going to write something that I want to read. I, I'm writing a, I wrote a book that I would want to read. I would want to learn about that and learn about it. Uh, are there other things that people could say about it? Or is there, a, a, is there an area of research that I have not mentioned? Of course, you know, you're not writing a 75 volume book on regret that nobody would read. Um, so anything you do is going to be open to the dissatisfaction of other people. It's going to be imperfect. And one concept that I've used in my writing and in my personal life is what I call successful imperfection. So um, successful imperfection is to make progress doing things imperfectly. So I'm not going to do an Olympic exercise like you might, but I'm going to do a reasonable exercise, but I'm going to do it on almost a daily basis. And so I'm going to be successfully making gradual steps imperfectly uh, toward my goal. And, and the outcome in terms of the writing or whatever I say or do is I'm going to accept that there are things that could be said that I didn't say. Uh, now the maximizer, you know, you know, I, you know, I remember talking to one of my editors about, uh, about somebody who had been very late on getting a book finished. And I, I said, gee, I thought this person wanted to write a book. Uh, he said, a lot of people say they want to write a book. What they really uh, should say is, I wish I had written a book. And one thing that gets in the way of very, very conscientious people in writing or in other areas of their life is this perfectionism. You know, oh, I don't want to, you know, submit this or I don't want to give this talk or I don't want to, you know, do this thing because it's not perfect. There's still something left to do. And so this is part of the fear of regret in the future, that if I do something and it's not completely finished, it's not completely perfect, I'll be thinking, oh, it's unfinished. Here's my view, Jason. Everything in life is unfinished. I mean, if I said to you, okay, I'm finished, I'm going to drop dead right now, <laughs> that wouldn't be a good outcome. You know? So we, we, you know, people who people who worry or people who fear regret or people who experience regret about the past think, oh, this thing was unfinished. It's incomplete. So what? So what is incomplete? That may not, that may be progress over what you had before. It may be useful. It may be a contribution. But this it, this fear of incompleteness, it's called the Zeigernick effect in, in uh, perception and cognitive psychology, it goes back to the 1920s that we tend to think, oh, it's incomplete. I've got to get it done. Uh, and so I regret it. And that underlies worry, it underlies regret, it underlies a lot of anxiety, incomplete, like I don't know, or something is left undone. Uh, it's like the idea of unfinished business. You know, people, somebody said to me in giving a workshop recently, how about the regrets of somebody who's, you know, the verge of dying, regret that they, um, that they uh, feel guilty that they didn't say I love you to somebody who's no longer there. Um, well, if they're no longer there, you can't say you love them. And so, you know, she, she said, well, um, you know, when we go to our grave, shouldn't we go to our grave with no regrets? Now, this is like a existential perfectionism. I'm going to go to my grave thinking I've closed up all the accounts of my life and, you know, said I'm sorry to all the people I hurt in my life. That's absurd. Right? Where's the rule that you have to have closure on the moment of your death? You're going to die, you know. So my view is that regrets, you know, regrets are like the background noise. Like you heard background noise uh, outside my window here early in the interview. Background noise is part of life. Regrets are part of life. Let them be there. It's like, you know, the traffic in New York City. Uh, yeah, there's a trade-off. If you're going to live in New York City, you're going to hear background noise. 
I, and I think one thing that we probably both see in our practice, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that people that are scared of regretting their mistakes or mistakes they're going to make spend a lot of time pre-processing and thinking and thinking and thinking before they take action because they want to increase the certainty of not making the yeah. mistake and not having that regret. And that amount yeah. of time of indecision or inaction ends up being more hurtful than actually maybe a trial and error of having a reasonably good hypothesis of how it's going to turn out, how how it should go, and then employing it and then learning from the success or failure of, of the behavior? Well, it's a matter of balance. Um, so for example, uh, yes. let's, let's take a guy who, uh, 35 years old, um, and has been with a woman for several years, lived with her, uh, and she seems to be, you know, quite a high quality person. And his thought is that uh, uh, I, maybe I, I, I'm not completely sure I'm ambivalent. Uh, and, uh, you know, what if somebody else comes along that's better or, you know, it's not exactly what I want. Um, and so, you know, a lot of people think that I can't make a decision if I'm ambivalent. The word decision in Latin means to cut away from which means by definition, you are ambivalent. And so you're making a decision to do this or do that. Um, so the idea, if the, 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 the point that this person makes, a lot of people make about ambivalence, the fear of ambivalence, is ambivalence is a bad emotion as opposed to ambivalence is realistic thinking. And uh, as I might, my, my comment was, uh, of course you're ambivalent. The reason you're ambivalent is that you know each other. I mean, if you first meet somebody and you idealize them, like Romeo and Juliet, you know, a 13-year-old and a 15-year-old, four days is the Romeo and Juliet play, and eight people or more are killed, uh, including Romeo and Juliet, all because they saw each other at a party and they immediately fell in love and idealized each other. There was no ambivalence with Romeo and Juliet. Uh, and in fact, some people during that time actually thought, that Shakespeare's point was to actually make fun of this kind of idealized, intense, overly romanticized infatuation. Because maybe what they should have done is they should have thought, let's get to know each other for a while before we get married and then commit suicide. Why don't we, why don't we give it six months and see if we still love each other? Um, so ambivalence can be simply collecting information where you look at the pros and cons. Like if you think about, you know, should I live um, in, uh, in uh, you know, New York or should I live in California or Florida or Connecticut, whatever it is, each one you're going to have trade-offs. Uh, so finding ambivalence is something where, well, you know, yeah, it's, uh, it's something that comes with any thoughtful decision. Um, uh, sometimes, uh, if I weigh the pros and cons for too long a period of time, like this young man, if he waits another year, uh, the, uh, the girlfriend may just leave him. She might say, well, if you can't make a decision after X number of years, uh, I don't want to be with you. So she may make a decision to break off with him. Here's the point. If you keep waiting you suffer what we call opportunity costs, the opportunity to pursue another relationship or the opportunity to get closure and move forward with this current relationship. So we always have to think like, like if I am looking around for the perfect partner, the perfect job, uh, what is the cost of searching? The cost of searching is that I don't move forward on this or I don't move forward on the alternative. And those, are, and it can be, take me a long period of time to pursue those options. So it's always about uh, optionality or, you know, moving forward, staying, each one has a cost and time is a cost. And we have to think about time factors if we keep putting off decisions. You don't have an infinite amount of time. So you brought up the principle here of um, opportunity cost. Um, so, so I, I just want to take a step back just to, to, to reorient people. So uh, l looking at re regret, there's the process of doing an action and looking at the regret in order to learn something. 
Uh, here we're talking about uh, uh, fear of regret uh, preventing us from healthily moving forward. So, you know, what, one thing that, that Bob had talked about before was over predicting regret that people assume that they're going to have a lot more regrets, which keep them stuck. Uh, he just talked about uh, importance of, of opportunity cost. Um, what about sunk cost? Because that's something you also talk yeah. a lot as I well. And, the and orient the, the listener to that, please. Because I don't think everybody knows okay, that, um, that that business principle. Right. Right. Yeah. I love the idea of sunk costs. Everybody knows what a sunk cost is. And here's the example. Uh, you go to your favorite store, which now is online, <laughs> and you spend a lot of money. You buy a new jacket, a new dress, a new outfit, whatever it is. You take it home. Uh, you try it on. And maybe you wear it once. And then you put it back in the closet. And it's sitting in the closet for five years. But every three months, you take it out and you look at it. No, it's not really me. I'll put it back in. So it's sitting there for five years. And your partner says, uh, gee, why don't you throw out that uh, or give away that garment? You, you never wear it. And you say, no, I spent good money on it. And I'll wear it some point. Or let's say you're pursuing a relationship. Like there's somebody uh, involved with a married man. She's pursuing a relationship. And she's in the relationship for three years, and he's never going to leave his wife. Uh, she's getting more and more miserable. And she says, no, I can't walk away from it. I put three years into the relationship. And then she comes up with all these reasons why it could work out. So the, the, the reason we call it a sunk cost is that you've already put the cost in. You've already put the investment in. You already bought the jacket. You already bought the dress. You already put the three years into the relationship, three years into that course of study. Um, the question is about future utility. Is that relationship really going to be positive in the future? Is that job going to be positive in the future? Are you going to wear that jacket? Are you going to wear that dress? And what we tend to do is we tend to stick with something because we've already put an investment in it. You know, oh, I can't throw out that jacket because I spend a lot of money on it. And so what underlies this is that it's regret, is that we anticipate we're going to regret throwing it out or walking away from it. And why do we do? Now, here's an interesting thing. Humans are the only animals who have sunk costs. You know, rats or pigeons, cats or dogs, you stop reinforcing them, they stop behaving. They say, hey, no more food, I'm going somewhere else. They don't sit there and try to justify pecking the green button, you know. They're not reflecting on themselves. They're not thinking, I have to make sense of my past behavior. But we, because we're humans and we reflect on what we do, we want to think we're good decision makers, we get, we get hijacked by a sunk cost. And you can see, I'm, immediately you can see it in yourself or other people. Uh, you know, should I, you know, I, I remember a couple of years ago I was getting computers for all my staff and I had this crappy old computer. And I'm thinking, you know, I'm thinking, oh, I can still use this computer, I can still use this computer. I began thinking, why am I sitting here with a crappy computer? Why don't I get a new Mac, you know? And so I decided, all right, so this, I'm going to, you know, erase the hard drive, get rid of the computer, sunk costs, it's in the past, move on, get a new, get a new Mac uh, or a new computer. Um, why do we get stuck in sell, sunk costs? One is we have a fear of wasting. So if I said to you, Jason, here's a $100 bill, what I'd like to do is to burn money in front of people you probably would think I'm crazy and you might actually be annoyed with me. You know, don't waste that money. I could use it or give it to a poor person or whatever. Say, no, I'd like burning. Nobody's worse off by virtue of my burning the money, but we can't stand the idea of wasting, you know, finish all the food on your plate, you know? Uh, no, no, you can't waste that food. Uh, don't throw that out. You can't waste that food. I can't throw out any of my books because I might want to read them again. Yeah, likely, really. If I already read them, I'll never read them again. So, <laughs> but we have that fear of wasting, and we think that we're going to regret it. That's why people hoard. 
you know, sunk cost is like hoarding your past behavior. I hold on to it, you know, uh, it'll come back, it'll be more useful, I'll regret it, I'll think back, oh, I should have stayed, it could have worked out, and all of that. So how do we break free of sunk costs? Once identify it as a sunk cost. I think all your listeners now know, they know what sunk costs are. The second is, if I had to do it over again, would I make the same decision? Would I go out and, if I'd lost that jacket, would I go out and buy it again? If the answer is no, then maybe you should get rid of it. The third thing is, am I missing opportunities by holding on to that sunk cost? If I stay in that relationship or stay in the dead end job, am I missing other opportunities uh, because I'm hijacked or stuck by the sunk cost or anchored by the sunk cost? Um, and we can think about what advice would I give somebody else? So we're very good at advising somebody else, hey, walk away from it. It's no longer useful. The relationship's not working out. There are better opportunities. Why do we do that with other people, but we don't do it with ourselves? Because we want to justify our own behavior. And that's it's part of cognitive dissonance in a way. We want to justify what we've done, think of ourselves as good decision makers. And finally, good decision makers know when to cut their losses. I've had a lot of patients who are very successful investors. And what they do is they cut their losses. They simply say, well, you know, I'm going to cut my losses here. I put a stop loss order in. So putting a stop loss order in may be a good way of avoiding regrets. But we tend to think, oh, if it comes back, then I'll regret it. You could, but you could also feel free that I walked away from it. I pursued new options. And I don't have to keep justifying a bad decision. Um, staying invested and investing more in something that is not a good investment because I have put a certain degree of investment in the past is not a great idea. Because investing more in a bad investment no. is still a bad investment, no matter how much you have put in it in, right. in, in the yeah. past. So we have those folks. What, what about the people that say... Um, I, I'm just, I just don't feel ready yet to make this decision. I need, I need to feel right. I need to feel ready to do it. Yeah. yeah so th this is the readiness uh, illusion uh, that I have to feel ready. I have to feel ready to exercise, ready to work on my, uh, uh, my homework, uh, ready to end the relationship, ready to be assertive, whatever. And this is kind of like an emotional reasoning. You know, I need to have this feeling in order to do it. So it's it's making my decisions based on a feeling I have. Uh, an alternative is to make a decision based on my goals. So if I want to get into shape or I want to lose weight or I want to get my cholesterol down or whatever it is, my goal is healthy markers. That's my goal. The question is, what do I have to do to achieve that goal? I have to exercise, watch my diet, whatever, may take medication, whatever the doctor prescribes. The goal is what determines the behavior, not the way I feel. So the readiness thing might be, well, I don't feel ready to exercise, or I don't feel ready to diet, uh, or I don't feel ready to say that to somebody. And the problem with that is that it anchors you to an emotion and it ignores your goal. Your decision should be based on your goals, not on your feeling. So let's say, for example, if I'm in New York and you know, and you you see me standing, my office is on East 58th Street, and you see me walking up and down East 58th Street, looking back and forth. It's actually a one-way street. But you see me looking back and forth. And you say, Bob, what are you doing? What are you looking for? And I say, Jason, I'm waiting for my motivation to show up, and then I'll go into my office. All right? You would think I'm a complete lunatic, and you'd probably be right. But, you know, it's – you make a decision based on the goals and on your values, not on feeling ready. You know, people with obsessive-compulsive disorder, um, how do you know you've washed your hands long enough? Um, and people say, oh, I have that feeling of completion. Uh, oh, I've completed it. I've washed my hands for 10 minutes. So now I feel completed. The problem with waiting for the feeling of completion is that you'll have OCD for the rest of your life. And what you have to learn to do is to wash your hands to 
the uh, the length of uh, singing "Happy Birthday," uh, ninety seconds or whatever, and then stop. In other words, don't wait for the feeling of completion. Have a rule that you're going to stop here. Readiness demands keep. It's one of the great illusions I think actually evolved from psychoanalysis. You have to feel ready to make a change. The answer really is you have to be clear about your goals. You have to be clear about what you're willing to invest and you have to be willing to make a decision. It's not about the way you feel ready or feel comfortable or not ambivalent. That is going to keep you stuck. And ultimately, you might regret not making a decision. I mean, depression from the behavioral point of view, as you know, Jason, is based on passivity and avoidance. That sounds like somebody who's afraid of regretting things. So b- before we we uh, we wrap up, I'm, and it, it's my fault, I derailed you in the beginning of the conversation. So I, I think you did a beautiful job here talking about being stuck because of fear of regret. Uh, but if we could just spend just a few minutes talking about I'm stuck in regret. I'm I have a lot. Of, I'm feeling a lot of regret now, rather of what I did in the past. How do we get people? How do I get or how do we get people unstuck when they're stuck in their regret? Right. Well, there there are a lot of things that we could do, but just to give you a few pointers, um, uh, one thing is to label it as regret. You know, I'm regretting it. Uh, The second is uh, to ask myself, is this regret going to be productive or is it unproductive? So uh, productive regret would be, uh, what is the take-home message to improve my behavior in the future? what did I learn from this? Uh, uh, is there something I can do today to make progress? Is there a plan to use my experience to become a better person? Never waste a good mistake. That would be productive regret. The unproductive regret is to say to myself, am I just dwelling on it over and over, coming up with the same thing over and over and criticizing myself? So if it's unproductive, then I say to myself, <clears throat> um, Am I engage? Should I engage in self correction, like learning from it, do something different in the future, or is am I engaged in self criticism? If I'm engaged in self criticism, how is that going to help me? You know, um, would I advise my best friend to continue criticizing themselves? Am I uh, exaggerating how much I I thought I knew when I made the decision? Because a lot of times we tend to think that we knew everything when we made the decision. I make a decision in real time with limited information under conditions of uncertainty. So if I made the decision in that way, like everybody, so the outcome could be either way. Um, Did I really control everything? Uh, uh, Can I make the best of what I have? So if you haven't married the perfect partner or you don't have the perfect job or don't have the perfect uh, uh, home or whatever it is, you might think about, well, how can I make the best of it? How can I appreciate it? How can I be grateful? How can I work on this? How can I build on it? Uh, The other thing is, am I idealizing the alternative? So a lot of times what people do when they regret, they think, oh, if I had married somebody else or pursued a different job, I would be so happy. You know, there are times when I was in high school, everybody thought I'd be a lawyer because I like arguing. (laughs) And so, you know, so when I see my high school uh, people at reunion, someone who haven't seen me since high school, oh, Bob, are you a lawyer now? I say, absolutely not. And I'm not a defendant either, but uh, I uh, I became a psychologist. And then sometimes I think, you know, gee, I wonder if I should have become a lawyer, you know? And then I think, no, nah, no, nah, I don't think so. I, I think, you know, I could idealize being a lawyer and prosecuting the guilty or defending the innocent, but... Uh, I don't think that would be as ideal as my imagination says it is. Uh, the other thing in terms of the rumination and you know, each, each of these things I discuss in the book, If Only, Finding Freedom from Regret, is, is that, that people who regret in the way you describe, Jason, are ruminating uh, and you know, looking for the answer, looking for closure, you know, looking for clarification you're never going to get complete clarification because you're never going to get all the facts and you don't need all the facts. You just need to make your life better in the future. 
So the way to deal with rumination is to ask yourself, is there anything I'm going to get from dwelling on this in the future? Second, what if I accepted uh, that I made a decision that wasn't the perfect outcome? I just accepted it. What if I'm willing to accept uncertainty? What if I'm willing to focus on committing to making my life better uh, and the various ways which you can always work on to make your life better? Um, I assign people rumination time, set aside 20 minutes in the afternoon uh, to ruminate uh, and then ask, you know, write down any ruminations you have about your regret at any other time. And then at uh, two o'clock in the afternoon, sit down and ruminate and then ask yourself, is this going to help? Is this unproductive? Is this simply going over the same thing? Should I just simply accept? I can accept I don't have a perfect life. I don't need uh, existential perfectionism. Um, I should aim for contentment, appreciation, gratitude. Many people have it worse. So there are a lot of things that we can do with this sort of post-decision regret. But keep in mind, Jason, that there are people who could be regretting for 10, 20, 30, 40 years about the same thing. And then your question is, what am I missing if I spend my life regretting? You know, sometimes we need to say our life is a series of chapters. So I made that decision, you know, five years ago. That chapter is finished. I'm starting a new chapter. And I'm going to be the author of that chapter. And I'm going to try to write the best chapter I can within the limitations of living a life. I'm going to write a chapter living a good life that's imperfect. Mm. And you, um, for some people, um, the impact on them might not be strong enough. So one thing to also, and correct me if I'm wrong, is consider the impact on people that you really do care about, whether it's your spouse, your kids, uh, if you're a teacher, it might be your students or whoever, your coworkers, people that matter to you. How is me being stuck in this regret and me, um, me not ha living life even with is, is impacting the people that I really care about? Because that can be very powerful as well, I think. You know, it's never too late to apologize and ask for forgiveness. Um, but even if there's no way that you could get forgiveness from the person because they don't want to give you forgiveness or they're no longer around, is that you can forgive yourself. And forgiving yourself doesn't mean, oh, what I did was okay. It means, you know, I got to own up to it. I did a stupid thing or an unkind thing. I'm an imperfect person and I feel bad about it. And I'm going to use that bad feeling as a moment in time to convince myself to be a better person in the next moment in time. I've made a lot of mistakes, said things that I wish I never said, you know, that kind of thing. But if I can own up and I don't, I'm not saying I do this all the time or even enough, but if I can apologize and if I can practice what I would call adaptive humility, that yes, I'm a human being, I made mistakes, I'm very sorry, you deserve better treatment, uh, that that's going to help you move forward. Owning up to a mistake is not the same thing as spending all your time regretting it. It's using that mistake to make myself a better person, to apologize to the people, to ask forgiveness, and to uh, and to understand that in the real world, Jason, we're we're all fallen angels. You know, we're not these perfect angelic fictional people. Uh, we're people who make mistakes, uh, who do things we shouldn't do. Uh, but we can put it in perspective and not define ourselves by a mistake. You know, it's kind of like if you think of your whole life as a pie chart, you know, like a circle with different pieces and stuff. And let's say that regret is a small piece in that pie. Don't make the mistake of defining yourself by that small piece. Take that piece out. Like you can see all these books on the bookshelves back here. You know, you could take, all these, you can take the books out, including this, the if only book, 
This could be your regret. And you can say, yeah, I regret that. And now I'm going to put it back on the shelf. And now I'm going to get on my life. That's a way of using your regret, acknowledging it, noticing it, put it in perspective, humanizing it, and then writing the next chapter. And you're the author. Okay. So I think I, I drilled you on regret this book, uh, your theory on it. But is there anything that I missed that you think that people should know about, about yeah. regret? Yeah. And I think... You know, a lot of people have what I call the pure mind thing. Like, uh, oh, will this book uh, help me or will these ideas help me to never have any regrets, right? Uh, if I said to you, uh, I'm going to promise you sunny days every day for the rest of your life, you would, you know I'm lying. You know, even if you move to sunny California, you're going to have rain, right? I'm not saying you won't have regrets, but what I hope is that you don't get hijacked by them. You don't get anchored by them. You don't define yourself by them, that you're able to step away from them. And you're able to say, you know, I'm going to move through my life and I'll have these regrets in the background, you know, things I may have said or done to remind myself of the kind of things I'm capable of, that I'm an imperfect person who we all have a dark side. You know, it's like people talk about the higher and lower self. I don't believe that. I believe it's the self. We have dark sides and up bright sides. Uh, we have complicated, confusing sides, and it's changing day to day. So this is not going to be, you'll never have a regret, but Put the, regret, the regrets over here. Put the book on back on the shelf and move forward in your life. When you take the book down, you say, what did I learn from this? What did I learn from that regret? And how could I do, how can I make myself a better person? And if I practice adaptive humility, which allows you to accept that you've made mistakes, uh, you're not going to get hijacked. You're not going to think, oh, I should never make a mistake. You should make mistakes. I and mean, if you think you're going to live a life without regret, you won't live a life. It's like you're not going to be able to swim without getting wet. It's not going to happen. I hope you don't regret having me on, Jason. <laughs> oh, no, no. I absolutely do not regret having you on. I've actually been uh, excited for you to come on the show one day. I regret not having you on sooner, but I'll handle that after the, after the show. Um, so for all the therapists that are listening right now, um, do you feel like they uh, should acknowledge to their clients uh, that they've, you know, maybe not going into detail, but that they've have regrets that, you know, I've hurt people. I haven't been my best selves. I made mistakes yeah. Yeah. And, and nobody's yeah. perfect. Do you feel like that's a powerful thing to do? Yeah, I think it's up to the clinician and, and what they feel comfortable with. But, uh, uh, you know, I think, I think that, that in therapy, you can become a role model to some extent. And the role model, a lot of times patients or clients are going to idealize us. Oh, you have it all together. Your life is on top. You're never unhappy, whatever. And, you know, in my books, like in my book, Anxiety Free, uh, that I published a few years ago, I acknowledge that, you know, uh, earlier on, I had panic attacks. You know, I felt like I was going to faint, uh, which really got me interested in panic disorder uh, or, you know, getting depressed over a breakup in a relationship many years ago when I was single or, you know, recognizing that I'm human. Uh, I'll, I'll tell the patient that uh, I have regrets. I've made mistakes. And, you know, something I'm going to make mistakes in the future. And why? Because I don't have perfect information because I'm human, and because I want to live a full life. And a full life includes mistakes. Yes, sir. And if you're, willing, if you're willing to make mistakes, you're willing to take chances. Making mistakes is the cost of making progress. Mm -hmm. And um, one last point for me is that mistakes don't always lead to mistakes. Way, way leads on to way. So you can make a mistake, make another mistake, and then 
make a decision that was really helpful in your life. But had you yeah. not made those two mistakes, you wouldn't have gotten to the point. And the other way too, when you actually have a success, a success doesn't lead to always lead to success. Right. A success yeah. could then lead to success that could yeah. then lead yeah. to, to a mistake. So yeah. I think people get stuck that a mistake leads always to a bad outcome. Nope. A mistake could lead you to a great right. outcome. I, I yeah. um, That's our next uh, one. Okay. So I'm sure people want to buy this book after hearing all the great information and hearing what else is in there. So um, um, where, again, what, what's the name of the book and where can they find this book? So the book is called If Only Finding Freedom from Regret and uh, published by Guilford. That's published a lot of my clinical books. Uh, and, you know, you could get it at a uh, bookstore or on Barnes and no uh, on Amazon or Barnes and Noble or uh, Walmart on, online. Um, it's uh, in paperback and uh, ebook, and there's a, uh, a, a audio book coming out in a couple of months. So, um, but I think I think it's the kind of what I hope is the kind of book that will help normalize what you're going through, help you understand why regret is there, uh, help you find some tools to be able to step away from the regret and sometimes use it and sometimes balance it and even help you make better decisions so you have less to regret in the future. Uh, I hope it, I hope it helps people accomplish those goals. Well, I mean, we know that your other books have, and I, I, I just, just because there's such gold of resources, I, I, you know, maybe we can mention a few more like the worry cure, uh, beating the blues, whether you're a clinician trying to learn CBT or just treat people with anxiety and depression, or you're a patient, uh, those books are absolutely fantastic. Um, out of, Thank I think you, you said 28 or 29 books that you have written. So uh, definitely take a look at the large repertoire of what Bob put out there because you, you will not be sorry reading uh, reading his work. Um, and if people want to follow you, keep up with you, see what you're up to next, how can they, you know, is there a social media page, a website or anything that they could do to, to track? Yeah, to so track if you, you could Google my name. Um, uh, I have an institute in New York, the American Institute for Cognitive Therapy, and our website is CognitiveTherapyNYC.com. Uh, you can also go to my uh, author's page on Amazon.com. Um, I have a Psychology Today blog. Um, but, you know, it, it's, uh, you know, looking at our emotions as there for a reason, that we don't have to feel good all the time, and unpleasant emotions and painful emotions will tell you something about what you need or may tell you that something's gone wrong. They're there because they help us. Try to make it useful. You're not going to get rid of regrets, but you could make better use of them. You could make better decisions if you anticipate things. And um, you don't have to get hijacked or stuck. Yeah. Yeah, I, I play a game with clients and I say, you, you name an emotion and I'll tell you why we have it. Stump me. Try and stump me and name an emotion that's not useful. And every single emotion exactly. is useful. Yeah. And if it's used cor correctly, like regret, it could be a very powerful tool to enhance your life. Yeah, so don't, don't hate regret. Right. Learn how to right. use it effectively. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Bob, thanks so much for, for coming on the show. I know you're a busy guy. Um, I'm sure the audience is going to absolutely take away huge takeaways from our conversation. So thanks again for coming on. Thank you, Jason. And it's good to see you again. You take care of yourself.